think of yourself more as a comedic actress, as a dramatic actress? How do you see yourself? So much of it is luck and being in the right place at the right time. You had a broken neck and you were out there in heels? Oh yeah. Well, because I didn't know my neck was broken. Holy cow. How did you guys meet? My sister was like, the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Go sister. <laughs> Hey family, it's Carlos Watson. One of my favorite conversations in a long time, the wonderful actress, Laura Benanti. You know her from Broadway. You know her from her wonderful Hulu show, Life and Beth. Of course, she's also got her wonderful one woman shows. But guess what? She is just a terrific human being. You're gonna love this mom. Here she comes, Laura Benanti. Hey, Laura. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yes, I'm nice to meet you. Hey, I saw something that said that there was a young girl once upon a time who lived at 54th and 7th, who used to look out her window, and I used to live at 56th and 8th. Whoa! So, where was this young girl going to school? Where was she hanging out? How long was she there? You know, I only lived there till I was four. Where did you go to school? So I grew up in Miami, and when I moved to New York for a combination of reasons, I lived in that area and I really enjoyed it. And so when I was hearing you talk about 54th and 7th and I saw yeah. you know, all those sorts of other things, all these other interesting ideas and I was talking to this wonderful singer, uh, Taylor Dane. I don't know if you remember uh, oh, Taylor Dane. Of course I know Taylor Dane. Yeah, and she was talking to me about being a young girl kind of looking out her window and just dreaming these big dreams about yes. music and about singing and about listening to the radio or yep. I don't know if you know Swiss Beats, the musician. Yep. You know, he was talking about being, you know, on 116th Street and the first time he heard a car go along, you know, bumping his song and, and it was playing oh, out. Oh, that's and, incredible. You know what I mean? So, I lo I, so I'm envisioning all of you artists in New York and, and, yeah. and dreaming. Do you know what I mean? So much of it is luck and being in the right place at the right time and yeah. being blessed and you know, whatever you want to call it, luck, blessings, whatever. But there are just so many talented people in this world who don't get to do what they love. Yeah, yeah. Even if they're extremely talented, you know. All I know is that I'm tempted not to go. Oh, it's insanity for me to worry so. I'll try not to. If you had not made it, and I know that you struck gold early on, you know, 18 and, and beyond, what do you think you would have done? You know, I have such an unusual story in that I didn't really struggle. Like, I, I was not a child actor at all. Right, right. Um, but I really wanted to be, and my parents were very adamant that I get an education and focus on, like, just being a kid. But when I was 18 years old, I got my first starring role on Broadway, you know, which is unheard of. Yeah. And then I just kept working from there. So, you know, my only struggle was I... Um, when I was like 22, I had a really, really bad accident happen on stage where I ended up breaking my neck. And so that was that was a real challenge. And I, I pulled away from theater for a while after that for a multitude of reasons. Um, but I think if I weren't a performer or an artist, I'd be a therapist. Tell me about breaking your neck. Because again, you're looking at a guy who was in a bad car accident, couldn't walk for three years. They said, I'd never walk again. So again, every day that I walk, even if only quietly in my mind is a little bit of a victory. So I'm super grateful every day, even just the little stuff walking. Whenever I run on a basketball court, in my mind, I'm winning. Yep. Um, yes. So, so, so what happened whenever I hear that neck, spinal cord, yeah. misdiagnosis, so, so what happened? I was in a show on Broadway called Into the Woods, and I played, which is one of my favorite musicals ever, written by Stephen Sondheim. I played Cinderella, which is a role I'd always wanted to play. And there was a pratfall, you know, where I ran across the back of the stage in heels and a dress and a crown and um, jumped up onto a moving platform and ran down the stairs and, and then and ended up on my stomach. Like, it, so that was the pratfall. It was pretty intense for someone who's not a, a gymnast or that like an athlete you know um <clears throat> and i had like i had like hurt my wrist and then i broke a rib and then 
I just one night I, I broke my neck and I was sent to, I was sent to a doctor who is not my doctor who did an x-ray and um, said, oh, I think you probably have herniated discs. So just go to physical therapy. So I did. So I went to physical therapy and kept trying to do the show, but I was feeling worse and worse and worse. You had a broken neck and you were out there in heels? Oh yeah. Well, because I didn't know my neck was broken. Holy cow. Because the doctor just took an x-ray and said, go to physical therapy, you'll be fine. And then I, it wasn't until I was at my parents' house and I was laying on the ground because I was just in so much pain constantly. And all of a sudden I couldn't feel my body at all. And I was sent to a different doctor who did an MRI. And he was like, we need to do surgery immediately. So he performed surgery on me through the front of my throat. I had to sign a waiver saying if I could never sing again, that I understood because they had to move the vocal cords to the side, which was terrifying. And then I had the surgery. And then like a month later, I went back into the show, a different show actually at the time. And then I felt pretty good for about three years. You know, everything's fine. Everything wasn't fine. Seven years later, I ended up at a different doctor who looked at the post-surgical MRIs and said, this person actually broke your neck more. <laughs> Oh, baby. I ended up having to get a second surgery through the back, which I then ended up moving home to my parents' house. I lived there for about six months. I'm making miso salmon and sushi rice. It's your favorite. Why are you staring at me? I don't remember the last time you cooked anything. I spoke to another friend uh, this morning who's down in Mexico right now, and she has ended up having lots of alone time during the uh, pandemic and during the last two years. And so she necessarily has had an opportunity and a need to just think about herself. And so I think that that's been an important part of it. But who were you nestling with during the pandemic? My husband and my then three-year-old daughter and I, we were actually in a cab on the way to the airport. I was gonna film a TV show in Chicago. And I got a call and they were like, ooh, we're gonna push filming by two weeks. <laughs> so we rerouted the cab to New Jersey where my mom and my dad live. Um, and thinking we'd be there for two weeks and we were there for eight months. So I distract myself by being busy. Right. And my husband calls me a pathological helper. Okay. So, you know, like right at the beginning of the pandemic, I had put out this call on social media, like all kids whose schools shows had been canceled send your videos of yourself performing to me with the hashtag sunshine songs and I'll watch them. And I thought I'd get like 20 videos and I got 20,000 videos. No. Yeah, I watched every single one. I commented on every single one. And then out of that came a documentary for HBO Max called Homeschool Musical Class of 2020. This may seem silly, but I know that a lot of high schools were gonna have their musical canceled. If you would like to sing and tag me, I want to see you. I want to hear it. So like for the first nine months of the pandemic, I was like <laughs> running as fast as I could, trying to help as many people as I could. Yeah. I put out an album. I donated the proceeds to Food Corps. I'm a sucker for you. Like I was just on a mission to help right. or be out of the goodness of my heart, but also I think to feel like I could control something. Anything surprise you that you learned about yourself? Being of service has always been a really huge part of me and my heart and my life. And I think that I looked at that as a selfless act. And I actually don't think it is entirely. I think there is a part of me that is fed there's a part of me that says, okay, you're worthy of being here. You're doing something. And just learning that I am worthy of being here just because I'm here. Have you always been a confident person? I've always thought of confidence, literally up until this moment, as like um, being brave. You know what I mean? That like 
you're confident, you assume that you're right. It's almost like it had a negative connotation for me. And I don't know if that's because I'm a woman and confident women, there's like a, there's like a side eye we give to the phrase a confident woman. It implies that maybe somehow she's like too big for her britches. Um, but I really like the idea of it being like comfortable in your own skin, realizing you're of value. I think some people are born with it, but I will say, I think I've grown into it and I've worked at it. That's gonna be the name of your autobiography. I wanna come see your one woman play, A Confident Woman. I'm in the show with Amy Schumer. Yeah, yeah. I think of her as an extremely confident person in that she is so brave. She really puts herself out there. You know what she stands for, you know what she likes, you know what she doesn't like. But I do think she's also willing to be wrong. She's not attached to always being right. She's not attached to being the person in the room who gets the most attention. And to me, that's confidence of just being able to be in your own space. And that is one of the reasons why I admire her so much and love working with her so much and just love being with her so much. The doctor came in and he explained to me and my sister and my husband who were all in the room, he said, um, you're gonna have to be here for at least five hours getting liquids. And without skipping a beat, my husband said to my sister, okay, cool, because I saw a place where you can paint pottery nearby. <laughs> you guys are like, is he gay? Um, <laughs> What's your husband like on the question of confidence? What would you say about him? He has really grown into his himself as well. He's six years younger than me. So when we first met, he was still like a bit of a boy. I mean, he was a man, but there was a lot of boy there still. And I've watched him work on himself. I have never seen a person work on themselves the way my husband Patrick does. He is constantly growing, constantly reading, learning, listening, educating himself. How did you guys meet? My sister. Nice, go sister. She's seven years younger than me. And uh, I, so I, I've been married three times. Yeah. Just, yeah. just like every little girl dreams. <laughs> um, that is a source of like pretty major embarrassment for me. I know that when someone Googles me, it's one of the first things they'll see. Um, and if I see that someone's been married three times, I still, I'm like, ooh, I definitely have a judgment. What is your judgment? What, what do you assume when you see that? I just assume that they're probably a little bit of a hot mess. And while some of that was probably a bit true about me, I mean, I was so young, I was 23, um, 23 and then 27. But what I realized now was, was that I just was like a hopeless romantic, you know? I really wanted these, I really wanted them to work. But after my second divorce, I went out on a date with an actor and my sister was like, the definition of insanity, <laughs> doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And so I went, I was like kind of skeptical because right, uh, right. Patrick right. was younger and neither of us were, our, our finest selves when we met. I was pretty heartbroken and in a not great place. Okay. And he was actually, and he would say this as well, I'm not speaking out of turn, he wasn't in a wonderful place either. And I think the empathy that we had for each other and the gentleness with which we were able to approach each other has now made for a really, like almost nine years later, has now made for a really beautiful relationship. It's funny, you said that thing about being misunderstood and it makes me think again about you as an actor. And and I've heard you say that you, you know, everyone wants people to root for them. And so that when you approach a role, you know, yeah. you try and make sure that people are gonna root in some way. Uh, yeah. for that and and so that desire to be understood it sounds like you also apply that to to your roles maybe too yes i want people to empathize with every character that i play whether they're behaving badly or in a way that's admirable you know and for me those are the performances i like to watch too you know i will never forget seeing sean penn and dead man walking ever i was 16 years old and thinking, 
This is a character we should absolutely hate for every second of this film. Don't cry, Mama. I don't want to see no cry. I'm not saying goodbye now. Call you night. Not that I will ever be at his level, but that's something that I, I strive for, is to humanize any character that I play, because everybody's the star of their own movie, right? As I was following you, I thought about you. I came to you thinking of you as a serious actor, but I realized that you also have a silly comedic side too. And you oh, like yeah. comedy and you swim in it very easily. Do you think of yourself more as a comedic actress, as a dramatic actress, as a, how do you, when you think about yourself, how do you, I mean, obviously I know what you're doing with Amy right now, but like, how do you, how do you see yourself? I feel like in our world, right. and in particular in our industry, right. Right. it's easier for people to compartmentalize you, to quantify you. You know, when I look at someone like Amy Schumer, Kristen Wiig, you know, actresses who are brilliantly funny, but also have enormous depth. That is what I strive for. I feel so blessed. I, I've been able to do straight plays on Broadway and musicals and comedies and dramas and TV and movies and recordings and singing with symphonies and impersonations and, you know, and I get to be a mom and a wife and a friend. And I am acutely aware of how blessed I am to be able to do that. I'm looking forward with you now and okay. I'm looking at, at a confident woman. Okay. And, <laughs> and so help me out. She and I are putting together um, her four great roles over the next 20 years. Oh, wow. What are we putting her in? I want to be able to play a variety of, of different um, emotions and circumstances. You know, I want, to, I want to do a drama. Like I did a film called Worth with Michael Keaton and Amy Ryan and Stanley Tucci. And I'm, I'm really proud of my performance in that. He would come home every night after work. He'd throw the ball with Nikki Jr. He would read Patty a book. He didn't even mind when Tyler made number two. He said he liked changing things. Wow. That's a hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was my whole world. And it is 100% dramatic, 100. Yeah, yeah. And then I mean, and then I was so lucky to do Amy's show, in which I get to be funny and have really tender moments. So I just want to keep doing that more. Like if people can just let me keep doing that more, I'm grateful. <laughs> Tell me about your one woman show. Tell me about this one woman show you're doing. So I have an album out actually that's yeah, a live. Yeah. Um, live at 54 below which is this really cool um spot where we used to live <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, and it's called in constant search of the right kind of attention i do shows all over the country and the world really where it's basically just me telling stories like you know i don't want to call it stand up because that does that's minimizing the craft of stand up but they are stories and i tell them in a way that are funny and then i inhabit the songs um you know, in a, in a different way. So technically it's cabaret, but cabaret always feels to me like, you know, somebody in like a sequin jumpsuit, like draped on a piano talking about how hard their life was. And that's not what I'm doing. Despite all I have written, he may not be very smitten and my hopes perhaps may all collapse kaput tonight at eight. My goal actually, if I could put it into the universe, is I would love to have like a Netflix special that is just that, me telling these stories and being funny and humorous and then singing songs. Can I try something with you called rapid fire? You mind if I try a little rapid fire with you? Of course. Okay, okay. What's your favorite movie of all time? My favorite movie of all time, The Sound of Music. <laughs> I like that. Okay, okay. Your favorite book of all time? To Kill a Mockingbird. What's your walk-on song when your time is finally up and when they open up the pearly gates for you and they're playing a song? What song are they playing for you? Well, I can tell by the way I use my walk-on. <laughs> your most interesting, enjoyable, or outrageous celebrity encounter? You know, no one is nicer than Antonio Banderas. 
I worked with him on Broadway and we are friends and just being with him is is an absolute joy. <laughs> The funniest, weirdest was when I, do you know Countess Luann from like the Real Housewives of New York? She does cabaret now. Right. So she invited me to sing and she was so sweet. And I was talking to her about my daughter and she was like, if you ever need anybody to watch her, I was a nurse. And she seemed completely real. And then I was just laughing, thinking of me being like, pop, pop, boop, boop, boop. hey, can you watch my baby for me? Have you ever met Melania Trump, who obviously you, you played on The Colbert Show? I met her pre-impression. I need to think long and hard about what I should do next. Okay, thought of it. I'm ditching that loser and moving back to New York, baby. I met her before the impression, um, very, very briefly. Um, she's very beautiful. Hey, Laura, this was uh, this was more fun than it's legal. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I really, I enjoy you, and um, um, I'm rooting for you. So if you hear a loud cheer out in California, that's me and my people. We're rooting <laughs> for you, Thank and you. Um, and I look forward to. Um, to just enjoying so much of your, of your work and, and your energy and your light. And so thank you for making time for me today. I really, thank it's you. very nice to meet you. Thank you for having me on and for such a thoughtful conversation. This has, this goes so much deeper than your traditional interview. It's really felt like a conversation. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Hey, really hope you enjoyed Laura as much as I did. What a wonderful human being. So much good energy, so open and free-flowing. Love how open she was about the question of shame, uh, the question of confidence. Loved how she talked about her husband. Loved how she talked about what it's like when people see that she's been married three times and what she thinks when she sees other people. I thought that was a very open, very honest moment. Uh, I hope to get to have more and more conversations like that. Uh, what a good person, what good people, and what a funny person. Uh, I'm rooting for it. Hey, listen, every weekday, we got a little magic coming your way. Don't miss us. Come see us. Be well.